was born Life begins and ends in the dust you form The faith commanded and the mountains move Fear is losing ground to our hope in you Unstoppable God, let your glory go on and on Impossible things in your name, they shall be done yeah. And freedom conquered, all our chains undone and defeat and Jesus has overcome Mercy triumph when the third day dawned Darkness was denied when the storm was gone Unstoppable God let your glory go on and on shall be done yeah. Unstoppable God let your glory go on and on oh, oh, oh. Impossible things in your name they shall be done shall be impossible your kingdom reigns unstoppable we'll shout your praise forevermore jesus our god unstoppable nothing shall be impossible your kingdom reigns unstoppable we'll shout your praise forevermore jesus our god unstoppable Nothing shall be impossible Your kingdom reigns unstoppable We shout your praise forevermore Jesus our God unstoppable Nothing shall be impossible Your kingdom reigns unstoppable We shout your praise forevermore Jesus our God unstoppable Man, I hope that you are excited to be here to worship Jesus together today. Uh, you know, that's, that song where it says, impossible things in his name shall be done. That's what we're praying this morning, is that the impossible would be done. And the impossible is this, is that dead people would come to life. And that people that were once dead, who have come to life in Jesus Christ, would celebrate him and honor him with everything that they are. And that's what we're about this morning. We are here to celebrate and to honor and to worship Jesus, the King of kings and the Lord of lords, because he is worthy. He's worthy just because he's God. And he's worthy because of what he has done for us by a sacrifice on the cross. And so we want to worship him together this morning. We just want to invite you to do that with us. And this morning, if, if you've come in here and uh, the enemy has been telling you lies, reminding you of, uh, of your past, telling you that 
God probably doesn't really love you, telling you that you're not worthy of his love, I want to remind you of something this morning. If you have placed your faith and trust in Jesus, your past is no more. If you've placed your faith and trust in Jesus, though we really are unworthy, he has given us the right to be called children of God. And this morning, your Father loves you so much. And this morning, he is for you. And this morning, you can rest in him. And so we want to sing a song this morning as we continue our time of worship together as just a declaration of truth. It's pretty simple. It's called Good, Good Father. It's just a declaration of truth and a reminder to ourselves, to be honest, of who God is and who we are because of Jesus. So let's worship together. stories of what they think your life but I've heard the tender whisper of love in the dead of night and you tell me that you're pleased and that I'm never alone you're a good good father it's who you are, it's who you are, it's who you are, and I'm loved by you. It's who I am, it's who I am, it's who I am. And I've seen many searching for answers.
thank you that you are a good, good Father who loves us, cares for us, who has done everything for us. We praise you this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Man, I hope you have been blessed by coming and worshiping our God together. I hope that it's been an encouragement to you, a reminder of the truth of the gospel, that God is for you and not against you. He sent his son to save you. And this morning, we need encouragement. Amen? We need it. And that's one of the reasons that we're here. We're here to worship God because he's worthy. But we are here to be gathered together as a family of faith that encourages one another in our faith. So I want you to take just a minute, turn to those just right around you. Since it's flu season, you might want to give them fist bumps, but speak some words of life and encouragement to one another. Well, good morning, everyone. If you'll make your way back to your seat this morning, we are so thankful that you are here worshiping with us at Ridgecrest. It's uh, just a pleasure to come together uh, to praise the Lord for how good he is to us. And it's so clear every single day where we can see his goodness around us. This morning, as you uh, walked in, you should have received a worship folder. It looks like this. I would encourage you just for a moment to take that worship folder out first. Uh, if you're a guest uh, with us this morning, maybe today is the first time you've been to Ridgecrest or the first time you've been here in a long time. I want to encourage you, the very back of your worship folder, there's a card. It says the guest card. You can tear that out, fill that out, and then tear it out. And then you can place it in the offering baskets in just a minute or drop it in a drop box on your way out. But we would rather you take that guest card uh, to our welcome center, which are out these doors right here to my right and right out here in this lobby area. I'd love for you to take the card there and see one of our volunteers and one of our staff at the, uh, the desk right there and we have a gift bag for you. We just want as a church our heart is to connect and build people uh, together with each other and so I want to encourage you to do that so that you can be a part of what God's doing here at Ridgecrest and our staff can reach out to you in the days ahead. Maybe you're a member of Ridgecrest there's a place there for a prayer request we would love to pray for you. If you have something you can fill that out as well and drop it in the offering basket. We'd love to pray as a staff for you and your family. Also in your uh, worship folder, you'll see a, a number to text. You can text a number if you want more information. Maybe that's easier for you and your family. Send a text to that number and uh, you put welcome there and, and it gives some text and information back. And again, just a heart to get you uh, plugged into what God's doing in our church. Also, a few other things uh, in your worship folder this morning that I want to make note of. L look through it, put it on your refrigerator, put it somewhere in front of you so that you can be a part of the different things that are happening. But first, the first off, the marriage retreat, February 2nd, 3rd, love for you uh, and your spouse to look at that and, and pray through being a part of that weekend together, $150. Also, we have a men's golf uh, trip coming up. You'll see that in there. The deadline's coming up really quick for that next week. There's a men's conference, our DNAL deadline, a lot of different things happening. So I want to encourage you to read through your worship folder, take note of those things so that you don't miss out on what God is doing. And so at this time, as we continue uh, in worship and think through just a, a heart of our theme of 2018 of God first, I want us to pray together as we continue to put him first, as we give to him uh, back, as we uh, give our offering and our tithes. So let's pray. Father, thank you for this morning. God, we believe your word as it tells us in Psalm 34 that we can taste and know that you're good. And God, we thank you for your goodness, that your goodness is not dependent upon any of our circumstances, but it's just simply who you are. So God, help us in day in and day out life just to trust in uh, who you are and what you do for us every single moment. And so Father, I pray this morning as we think, continue about this theme of God first, that you would speak through our pastor, anoint him and use your words this morning to convict our hearts. And then from there, God, strengthen us to obey what you're leading as we think about our time and uh, just the uh, day day in and day out, the things that we do and the where we spend it and how we, we use our time. And so God, speak to us this morning. Father, I pray for this offering that you would continue to, to use 
use our church, God, our hearts to take Jesus to the world. And so use our church uh, as we give to you and give back in a heart of obedience to continue to further the gospel uh, in the days ahead through all the ministries that are happening here. And God, above everything, again, we praise you for who you are and what you do for us. And pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Take your Bibles and open up to the book of 1 John, 1 John chapter 2. We're doing something a little different today. I'll tell you about that in just a bit, but I want to do a couple of things while you're finding your place as well. You'll understand why the band is staying up here in a minute. I'm going to be singing with them. and You laugh. Uh, okay, Jonathan, nothing from you. Okay, nothing. Uh, Jonathan said, Pastor, you said it. You can't lie in church. But um, but people do it all the time. So, um, but let me do a couple of things that I want to do. With you. First, the first thing I want to do is I want to welcome in all of those who are joining us by live stream. Now, listen to this. We have people now. We're we're learning the different venues, and we have people watching us. Uh, uh, hundreds of people watching us through Facebook Live now, and um, through satellite. Uh, direct television, disc television, streaming online uh, uh, directly, and uh, then the other uh, 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 venues, television venues that we have. But right now we have an audience around the country of people that are watching us uh, through live stream. And uh, would you help me welcome them in? We're glad that you are tuned in to our worship experience with us and hope that the Lord uh, blesses. The second thing I want to mention to you uh, today is a National Right to Life Sunday. We celebrate life, and churches across America are celebrating life. We believe in life. We believe life is valuable. Uh, our job isn't to condemn those who have not understood the, the importance of protecting the unborn. That's, that's not what we're here for. We're here to affirm uh, life. And, um, and, and life is important to us. Uh, primarily and particularly because the Bible says that you and I are created in the image of God. And that's what gives life its value. And we support some ministries like Wiregrass Hope Group. We support them through our, our budget. And then we do a thing every year called a baby bottle boomerang kind of thing. And beginning Wednesday, we'll have uh, uh, baby bottles that are supplied to us by Wiregrass Hope, a ministry to help unwed mothers and help women make the kind of choice to protect life and then to help them with that. And so we'll have these baby bottles here and to begin Wednesday through next Sunday, you can take one of those. You, we always ask you to fill it up with change and we turn it over to them. It's a way, another way of helping support uh, the work that they're doing. But uh, we believe life has value. And uh, we always want to, uh, we always want to affirm a life that God has created. You know, I said last week, you may be a person that said or have heard something like this in your life. Well, we didn't plan on you or we didn't intend to have you or something like that. I think uh, sometimes uh, that can be a real tough thing to have to hear. But I want to tell you this. God did. Every life in a womb or that exists, God created. And that's why we, we believe so strongly in affirming 
uh, the right to life and to be a voice for those who have no voice. And again, our, our job isn't to condemn, ours is to affirm. And that's what we do. And so I want to lead us in prayer about that. Would you stand with me as I lead us in prayer as we affirm, thank God for that and pray for uh, those yet to come that He has created. Father, we do thank You for uh, those um, little ones. Uh, Father, uh, some in the womb now, some uh, parents struggling to know whether or not they should keep that child. Would you put in their hearts the value of a life and that that may be the life that changes the world or changes history on some level. So, Father, I pray that you'll help uh, uh, men and particularly uh, moms as they struggle through that. Father, our job isn't to condemn anyone. It is just to love and affirm. And so, Father, we do. We affirm those and even those who may have made choices in the past that, uh, Father, uh, that, that they struggle with even today. Would you, would you give them freedom from that as they move forward, God, to new things that you have for them? But for all the little ones out there, Lord, that are still to come, you said that before a child is put in the womb that you form them, Lord, in, in your mind, in your heart. We thank you for that. Uh, and life is valuable because you are the author of life. We're important G enough that Jesus died for us because you think life is valuable and you wanted our life uh, reconnected to you. We thank you for that. Father, would you affirm those ministries who are helping moms and dads and um, little ones, Father, uh, as they uh, make the choice uh, for life? Now, Lord... Um, uh, firm them and bless them, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. You can be seated. Um, and then um, I, I'm, I'm going to do something. I'll go ahead and tell you. I, I want to introduce the message to you this morning. And then I'm going to do something that we've never done. In over 38 years of ministry, I've never done this. And it, it, so you've got to help, okay? Because um, you've got to come back. We're going to send you on a field trip in a few minutes. I mean, literally, we're going to send you out of the doors there. Not out of the building, but we're going to send you on a field trip, okay? Just keep that in mind. My message will be brief if you cooperate. <laughs> but you'll understand here in just a minute. Today, what I want to do, I'm going to read one verse to you. I preached on this passage not too long ago out of 1 John chapter 2. Uh, but I, I want, today, what I want to do is take one verse verse 17, and I want, to, I want to show you how it relates to what we've been talking about since the new year began, and that is making God first. And we're talking about life management. We're talking about managing the gifts and the abilities and the talents that God has entrusted to us. Well, He's entrusted something else to us. He's entrusted time. And we're accountable for our time. Now, I want, so I want to talk with you about life management, about time. I'm not going to talk to you about planning systems, and that, that's not what I mean when I talk to you about this. But what I want to talk to you about is how God can be Lord of your calendar, master of your clock. And if God is, first, if God is really first in your life, He will be the master of your calendar and clock. We often don't think about our time as it relates back to being a trust from God. We all say things like this, I don't have enough time in the day. But the fact is, you really do. You have, because God knows what He put you here for, and God knows you've got enough time to do everything He wants you to do. We may not be good manager, uh, managers of our time, but all of us have the time of our life. We have the time that God has entrusted uh, to us. In fact, the psalmist says this, he says, teach us to number our days rightly so that we may gain wisdom. You know, if you had a bank uh, account that credited every morning $86,000 to you, and, and uh, it carried over no previous balance from the day before, uh, and it allowed you to keep no cash in your account, and every evening it canceled whatever part of the amount you failed to use during the day, what would you do? You would try to spend it. But can you imagine spending $86,000 a day? For a while you say, yeah, I can. Some of you say, yes, I could do it easily. You could for a while, but, but then you begin to say, gosh, what do I do now with this? But what you would do is you would draw all of it out of the bank, wouldn't you? If you can't carry it over, you say, well, I'll, you know, I'll just keep drawing it out of the bank at the end of the day because I can't carry it over, and uh, what I don't use, I waste. Well, I want to tell you something. You do have a 
you do have a bank account like that. And it is called time. And every day, God puts 86,400 seconds into your account. And, and you can't carry them over. And at the end of the day, what you haven't used wisely, you lose. That's why it's so important that you and I look at time as something that God has entrusted to us, something that we're going to be accountable for. It's something that we are stewards of. You only have so much of it. And by the way, all of us have different amounts of that, right? We all have different amounts. But let me remind you, your different amount was given to you by God, and it's enough for you to do what God wants you to do and put you on this earth for. So we have to be stewards of it. Look, I'm not going to make you stand this morning, but look at this one verse in uh, 1 John chapter 2 and verse 17. Look, look what John writes. He says, and the world is passing away along with its desires, but whoever does the will of God abides forever. That's an interesting verse because it really is a verse that talks about the connection of time and the purposes of God. Pray with me. Father, open our hearts and our spiritual ears to hear your word this morning as we think about how you can be Lord and master of the clock and calendar. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, the verse there, this verse 17, actually comes in the context of a discussion that John is having about being in love with God or in love with the world. And you know, he says you can't do both, right? You'll either, you, and Jesus even said that. You remember he said, no man can serve two masters. And that's really kind of the idea here. If you were to go back and read the previous verses, uh, John is talking about that whole kind of idea that you can't, you can't serve the world, uh, world's agenda and at the same time serve God's and, and, and vice versa. The segment is really about how you use your life and how you use your time. And so as we think about uh, God being first in everything uh, in our life uh, and us being responsible stewards, we need to think about our time and how that's used. So I want to give you three things uh, that we're going to look at. The first is this, I want you to notice that your time needs to be managed for God because it reveals the passing of this world. It reveals the passing of this world. You notice the first part of the verse is what he said. He said, and the world is passing away. The world, and with all its desires, it's passing away. Now, are, are y'all familiar, y'all, are y'all aware of what happened in Hawaii about a week ago? Y'all remember, did y'all, how many of you heard about that? I mean, that's pretty frightening, I bet, if you were in Hawaii, don't you think? You remember that uh, uh, everybody received this national alert that missiles had been launched at Hawaii, and they had 30 minutes to prepare and there was panic, um, uh, it said. By the way, uh, there were a lot of different interesting stories that emerged and a, a number of different headlines. For example, one headline uh, uh, said this, Hawaii missile scare fills, this is after the fact, obviously, it fills churches. Hawaiian missile scare fills churches, listen to this, and sends confession lines out the door. They had 30 minutes. What'd they do? It filled the churches up. I wish I had that button. You know, I mean, fill the churches up. And they said the confession lines were out the doors. People trying, what are they trying to do? Suddenly they've come to grips with the fact that life as they know it may be over. And guess what they're trying to do? They're saying eternal stuff really matters now. By the way, we all know that what, now what happened is that uh, 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 an official with the emergency management agency in Hawaii pressed the, uh, pressed the wrong button. It, somebody said it was the equivalent of a, you know, a, a fanny dial on your phone kind of thing. You just press the, the wrong button. And uh, wasn't, wasn't that tactful how I said that? Didn't y'all like that? Uh, <laughs> but listen to this. It said, as soon as that alert came, the other, one of the other things, there were a lot of stories, but uh, intriguing. It said that as soon as the alert came, uh, porn, pornography viewership went down immediately. And as soon as they got the all clear, there was a dramatic increase in porn viewership. You understand what I'm saying? Oh, if, if, if this is the end, I'm going to try to get things right. If it's not, hey, I'm back to my old habits. What a tragedy to not understand the importance of time. Now, I, I know you and, and, and I are glad that it was a false alarm. We're all glad for that. 
But don't you think today the people in Hawaii are thinking a little bit different about the things and priorities of life, the things that are really important? They interviewed a guy, saw a guy, and he said, man, it just came, made me come to terms with what's really important in life. And it would, wouldn't it? And it should. The fact is, oh, listen to this. John says, one day the world is passing away. And the Bible says, we don't know when that is, but it's, we're closer now than we've ever been. And that it's going to happen. The world is passing away and the desires of the world, and one day it's going to happen. There's going to be a trumpet shout. That's the only alert we're going to get. And the world as we know it is going to pass away. It's in the process of passing away uh, as, as well. And, and the day's coming when we'll be ushered into eternity, whether through the return of Christ or through our time being up, we'll be ushered into eternity, either an eternity in heaven with God or an eternity in hell. And that's why we need to understand how important time is. Our world is running down. Contrary to some people who argue that we're getting better and better. Do you know most uh, social scientists try to argue we're getting better and sharper. We're evolving into better. Really? I don't know of anybody that's sane that really believes that. I just heard about something today. Jerry Tyree was telling me about a new fad. I didn't know about this. Some of y'all will know about it probably. I didn't. Listen to this. There's a new kind of fad where, where students are challenging each other on the internet to eat Tide Pods. Have any of y'all heard of that? Look at that. I'm out of touch. I just heard about it today. I can't believe it. By the way, students, don't you dare. I mean, this, people are dying. Did y'all know that? They're dying from taking this challenge. It's like putting poison in your system. It just destroys you. Either they aspirate it into their lungs, or if it gets into their stomach, it's like drinking, uh, drinking acid, and it just tears their whole system up. They're dying. They're dying trying this, and they're challenging. It's not like the ice bucket challenge. I did that, and that's the only time I'll ever do that again. <laughs> but it's not like that. But listen, I, I thought, we're, not, we're getting smarter. The people that are doing this are going to be voting in the next election. You know the reason that they're creating these driverless cars? It's because we got, we got a section of the population that's so dumb they eat Tide Pods. And so somebody said, we better create cars. We don't want these people driving. They're not very smart. We're getting better and better? I don't think so. Listen, environmentalists tell us that we're destroying the planet. Cosmologists tell us that it's only a matter of time until the earth is struck by some significant uh, meteorite or a comet and wipes us out. And atomic scientists, uh, the atomic scientists have a thing called the doomsday clock. Have you ever heard of the doomsday clock? It's reset every year. And the doomsday clock is uh, designed to kind of point us to um, how close we are to nuclear annihilation on the planet. And uh, when it strikes midnight, they say that's the ultimate. Uh, and they, so they adjust the hands. In 2016 and 17, the hands were adjusted to two and a half minutes till midnight. And that's the, that's the closest it's been since the, the early 1980s. And then they began to back it off. Things seem to be, be better in that regard. But today it's at two and a half, two and a half minutes till ultimate uh, global uh, annihilation and catastrophe. That's what atomic scientists say. I read this week from the bulletin of the atomic scientists. By the way, they're going to reset the clock. They do it each year. Guess when? This week. Be interesting to see if they move it closer, further back, or leave it at two and a half minutes till midnight. But I think you would agree that that's pretty significant. Listen to what they say. For the last two years, the minute hand of the doomsday clock stayed set at three minutes before the hour, the closest it had been to midnight annihilation since the early 80s. In its two most recent annual announcements on the clock, the scientists, Science and Security Board warned, and I quote, the probability of global catastrophe is very high and the actions needed to reduce the risk of disaster must be taken very soon. In 2017, we find the danger to be even greater, the need for action more urgent. It is two and a half minutes to uh, a catastrophe. 
The clock is ticking, global danger looms, and wise public officials should act immediately, guiding humanity away from the brink of annihilation. Wow. Listen, we don't need the doomsday clock to tell us that the world is passing away. The Scripture teaches us that. And by the way, we don't have to live in panic because of that. But we need to understand that time is our opportunity between now and eternity. And we have to grasp the brevity of time in comparison to eternity. And we have to grab hold of the opportunities of time that God has entrusted to each of us while we still have time. This is why Paul wrote and said, look carefully then how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise, making the best use of the time because the days are evil. You see, time is precious because the world is passing away and we must use it wisely because we are going to give an account of it. Now, one of the things I want us to do, I'm going to stop right there. I've got, I've got two more points. I'm going to be brief with those points, but I want us to take our field trip now. And our field trip is about a way that you can use your time to honor God. You see, if we all thought it was all going to be over right now or in the next half hour, we would be making sure we had some things lined up. It's just the way we are. But we ought to be doing that anyway because we don't know when Jesus is going to burst through the clouds. We don't know when He's going to say to you, your time is up. And so we want to be good stewards of our time. You know how you become a good steward of your time? You pursue God. That's the first thing I tell you. If if you say, well, what would I do? And I'm going to tell you a connection when we come back in here between time and the will of God. But what we would do is we'd say, how can I pursue God? Well, there are a lot of ways to pursue God. One of the things we began to talk about as a staff back in our fall retreat was uh, uh, we want to connect more people in small groups. And the reason for that is small groups are the heartbeat of a church. If you don't have one, you need one. And so what we've we've done is we've set up down Mission Hallway. There are four stations there. They're all the same, so you don't have to go to some. But we want we want you to take a little field trip, and um, we want you to walk through and see the different offerings. And if you don't have a small group, you've been thinking about connecting with a small group. Staff's going to be there. People from the various groups will be out there. You stop by the table. We're going to take. It is 11:30. We're going to take 15 minutes. And then I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to come back and I'm going to give you two final things, two final thoughts. But I want you to move about 15 minutes, okay? Now look, come back. <laughs> Please come back. I'm nervous. In the meantime, by the way, you don't have to stay out there for 15 minutes. You can just kind of circle around, look, and connect. But if you don't have a small group, would you take this moment to say, you know what, I need to get connected in a small group. And so they'll be out there, staff again, but I'm going to walk out there uh, as well. Um, and then when you finish, you can rotate back in here. The band is going to be playing all through that time, okay? So some of you may say, I'm already in a small group, and I'm faithful in a small group. So you say, I'm just going to sit here and enjoy the band. You can do that. But, um, but I want to urge everybody to get up here in just a moment, to walk. Now, y'all know what I'm talking about, Mission Hallway? Everybody know? If you don't, follow the mob. I assume the mob. Y'all help me. Come back. All right? Uh, and, then, and then you'll make your way down there. Look around. If you haven't connected, would you connect with a small group? And then I want you to come back in. 15 minutes, I'm going to finish up the message and uh, give you a couple of more points quickly, and then we're going to be gone. All right? Field trip. Field, now, I don't know any churches that do field trips. It's hard. It's good for everybody, even if you're already in a small group. Oh, okay. Okay, there's a card. Jonathan is just telling me that there's a card at those stations, right? Even if you're already in a group. You need to pick that card up, okay? So if you're already in a group, you go to. Are y'all ready? On your mark, get set, come back. I mean, go. I'm 
hey, y'all came back. Did I made you, I told Chuck, I said, I sufficiently guilted them into coming back. Except some may have left, and I want you to know we were taking names. And so we know. <laughs> At any rate, uh, wasn't it fun? I don't think I've ever done a field trip out of worship before uh, today in all these years. But uh, I hope you found, if you don't have a group, I hope you found a group that you can, or at least you can look at, you got information, connect with a small group. You need a small group. You really do. It's the life and heartbeat of our church. Uh, and uh, it's there that you're cared for and you connect with others. And so, and by the way, you can try several different ones until you find the one that you say, this is where I really kind of connect. And so I want to encourage you again uh, to do that. All right, now let's get back to our text. The, the, y'all remember the first thing that we talked about? What was it? Somebody tell me. Time management is important because... All right, it reveals the passing of this world. It tells us that this world is passing away. You know, in eternity, time isn't an issue, right? But it's an issue right here. And the reason we have a clock and a calendar is because God has only given us so much time on this planet. In eternity, it's going to be irrelevant. And, and by the way, time is irrelevant to God because God has always existed in the past. And, and so God has, it transcends time. And that'll be the way it is for eternity. But until eternity, we have to manage it for God. And that leads to the second thing I want you to see this morning. And that is, not only does it reveal the passing of the world, time relates to the priority of God's will. Did you notice the second thing he says there in verse 17? He says, the world's passing away along with his desires, but whoever does the will of God abides forever. The world is passing away. Time is limited. And that means we have to prioritize our time for God's will. That means we have to ask, how will I mark my days? How are my days uh, identified uh, for God? You have a priority mission. Every one of you in here, uh, all of us uh, have this priority mission. You know what it is? God's will. And the reason that mission is important because when we do God's will, we bring glory to God. We were created, we talked about last week, to bring glory uh, to God. When we do God's will, we bring glory uh, to God. And that's why the mission of God's will uh, is priority for us. But how do you prioritize God's will and time? I mean, we we often say, well, I I don't know if I have enough time to, to do what I need to do. That's really about priorities. And when it comes to God's will, how do we prioritize God's will in light of eternity and the amount of time God has given us? So let me give you four suggestions that will help you, help you prioritize your time in God's will. The first thing is this, you have to see your life in relation to the kingdom of God. You have to see, you know, Paul says that when you get saved, your, your citizenship is transferred from the kingdom of this world to the kingdom of God. You have to begin to see, if you want to prioritize the mission of God's will, you've got to, be, uh, you've got to see yourself from the perspective of your citizenship in the kingdom of God. What we tend to do is we see ourselves in light of the kingdom of the world. How am I advancing in the world? How am I doing what I need to do in the world system? But the fact is, you and I need to process where we're going, what we're doing, the will of God in light of the kingdom, not in light of this world. Here's a second thing you can do to prioritize your time and the will of God. Be honest with yourself about how you use time. Be honest. You don't have to be honest with other people around you, but you need to be honest with yourself. You know, the worst kind of deception in the world. you know what the worst kind of deception in the world is? Self-deception. It's when we're not honest with ourselves. And if you want to prioritize your time, remember, and and let me just add this little footnote. Your time is actually God's time. If God doesn't give it to you, you don't have it. And God can take it away from you at any moment. So when I say your time, I mean by that the time that God has entrusted to you. That that makes sense? Okay. So, So when you look at your time, and you look at the will of God, uh, you, you need to say, God, how am I using my time? Um, and, I, and be honest w- with yourself. A third thing is, let the things of God adjust your agenda in life. Now, I told you something, I don't know if you picked up on this, but you have exactly enough time to do what God expects you to do. Now, you do not have enough time to do what God expects me to do. But you have exactly enough time to do what God 
created you to do. And so that, again, it points us back to the why it's so important to manage the time of our life. And so you have, what you have to do is say, God, I'm going to allow the things of the kingdom to adjust my agenda. What we often do in life is that we say, God, here's what I want to do. Would you bless it? God, would you adjust your will to the things I've already decided I'm going to do? That's backwards. And by the way, God never adjusts his will to affirm your agenda. But what God does is he says, I want you to adjust your agenda to match up with my agenda, and that will accomplish my will. So you've got to, you've got to let the things of God adjust your agenda. And the fourth thing is, do what you already know God wants you to do. You know, if you want to be in on the will of God, start doing what you already know God wants you to do. And there are probably some of you in this service today, and if you were honest, there are things that you know God wants you to do. There are adjustments you know God wants you to, to make. And you may even do something like this, say, well, I'll eventually get around to it, or that sort of stuff. Or you may even think like this, well, I have all the time in the world. Have you ever used that phrase, or have you ever heard somebody say, well, I have all the time in the world. The fact is, no, you don't. You have all the time that God has allotted to you. And remember I told you last week, I quoted Jesus when Jesus said, the very hairs of your head are numbered, and if a sparrow falls to the ground, he knows that a sparrow falls to the ground. What does that mean? It means that God is in control of everything. And that means God's in control of the big clock. And that means you have a, uh, you have a, a segment of time. And that's why there are diff- some people, God calls them home uh, earlier than others. They have, but I promise you this, everybody has enough time to fulfill what God put them on this earth to do. And so that's why it's so vital that you do what you already know God wants you to do. And so if you're here today and you say, here's some things, I'll eventually get around to it. I'm eventually going to get it all straightened out. You can't count on that. You can't be certain of that. And so that's why you have to prioritize the will of God, the will and work of the kingdom over the will and the work of this world. Jesus said this in John 9. He said, we must quickly carry out the task assigned us by the one who sent us. Because the night is coming when no one can work. We don't, know how, we don't know when that night is coming for us. We don't know when we'll be at that place where we can no longer fulfill the purpose of God in our life, but it's coming. And because that is true, we can't procrastinate. In 1959, listen to this. In 1959, uh, it was a great year. Oh, it was a great year. I was born that year. Um, 1959, an organization formed called the Procrastinators Club of America. Actually formed the Procrastinators Club of America. And their motto was, never do today what you can put off until tomorrow. Really was their motto, the Procrastinators Club of America. I got to thinking, I bet a lot of people wanted to join, they just never got around to it. But um, you can't afford to procrastinate with the will of God. You just can't do it. It's too important. And you can't recapture what you waste. So that's why you've got to maximize what you have, because you don't know how much more of it God's going to grant you. We can't assume that we'll get it all straight later on. Um, okay. You can't go back. You can say, God, today I'm going to live for you, and if you give me another day tomorrow, I'm going to elevate the will of God. So listen, all you have is right now. Live for God. Use your time wisely. Make God first. I hope you all got bracelets to remind you, God first. If you didn't, we still have a bunch of them out there. You feel free to pick some up. How you use your time is essential. And that leads me to the last thing I want to show you, and that is that time recognizes the prominence of eternity. Time recognizes the prominence of eternity. Okay, look at verse 17. If you're not writing, look at verse 17. And the world is passing away along with its desires. That's point number one. But whoever does the will of God, that's point number two, time in relation to the will of God. And then three, abides forever. Time, time as we know it, recognizes the prominence of eternity. Eternity trumps everything. That's why, again, 
When the missile scare happened in Hawaii, everybody got real serious. So why, why something else kind of strange happened? Uh, 9-11. It's my first year's pastor here. 9-11. It's been almost 17 years ago. And uh, 9-11 came, and I won't ever forget, uh, and m- many of you remember that. Some of you weren't even born when 9-11 occurred, but a lot of you were, and you remember what happened on that day. It was one of those kind of days in history that, that are marked where you always remember what you were doing, where you were, when somebody told you, or them. I was sitting in my study, I was studying, my wife called me, I have a television in there, uh, and my wife called and said, you need to turn your television on. I said, what, she's, you know, and she begins to tell me, okay. Now, so we all, most of us remember, if you weren't there, you at least remember watching or seeing or hearing about it in the past. Do you know what happened after 9-11 in churches across America? What do you think? Attendance shot up record highs. Record highs. Because we didn't know what was coming. People didn't know what's coming. Prayer meeting on Wednesday night, man, people want to pray. Let's pray. They were here. I'm not fussing. It's the right place to come. I'd rather come here than the bar. Oh, 9-11, let's go to the bar, you know, and, and get wasted or something. I, but the churches all across America were full on the Sunday afterwards, the Wednesday nights, all of that. And, um, and you know, there was some hope that maybe, maybe, just maybe that God could use this to spark a national revival. But within three months, by December of tw- uh, 2001, Listen to this. Well, you know, things had settled down, looked like we were in control again with those who had, had perpetrated these things. Our economy had s- settled back down. Everything was feeling kind of normal. Guess what happened? You, I bet you can answer, can't you? You know what happened? Attendance did what? Pew. Listen to this. It not only went down, it went down below pre-9-11 um, uh, figures and it never came back up. It's just something, isn't it, about the, to coming to grips with eternity that produces a kind of urgency. And that's why, that's why God wants us to get something, and that is that time recognizes that in the end, eternity takes precedent over everything. The prominence of eternity. According to authors of the book, a book entitled Time for Life, the average American has more free time today than in any time since 1965. And there are uh, two uh, uh, time management experts. They studied the daily routines of Americans over the past 30 years, and they reached an interesting conclusion. This is what they discovered, that our leisure time has increased almost five hours a week in the last 30 years, almost five hours a week. And knowing that most people feel more rushed today than ever before, do y'all feel rushed? You feel rushed a lot of times more ever before. I I had I got together some young couples of a couple years ago, and I said, "Tell me what you do in free time." And they all rolled their eyes. We don't have free time. I said, "Do y'all hang out? Do y'all get together?" They said, "We don't have time to get together." And then when we do get a break, we're so tired. All we want to do is rest. And you see, so a lot, there's a lot of that in our, our culture today, in spite of the fact that maybe we have more time, uh, more leisure time than ever. But here's what the study went on to show. The authors say more leisure time has actually accelerated rather than slowed down the pace of life. Because we have more opportunities now and more things tugging, pulling. And listen to this, on average, Americans spend, listen, on average, 54 minutes a week in religious activities. 54 minutes a week in religious activities. How much time do you think they spend watching television? The average American watches over 19 hours of television a week. Now, now just think, if we're going to understand the prominence of eternity and the will of God, 54 minutes, 19 hours. Are you with me? You, you understand You've got, to, you've got to begin to see eternity has great significance such that what I do here and now between here and eternity has to change if I'm going to accomplish the will of God and the purpose for which he put me here. Um, Jesus said this, that he's coming back, and that may be how eternity uh, is initiated. Uh, that may be then. We know we're closer than ever before. And he said this, that, 
that concerning that day and that hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. And he said this, so be on guard. Keep awake, for you don't know when that time will come. We don't know, but the time's coming. So here's our, our task, is to be faithful with our clocks and with our calendars, to make God first in our clock and our calendar until he returns. When Sir William Russell was being led to the gallows to be executed, um, <clears throat> his physician was walking beside him. And at a certain point before he approached the gallows, he stopped and he turned to his physician and he took out his, uh, his pocket watch. And he disconnected and he handed it to his physician. He said, here, would you take care of this for me? He said, I won't be needing it any longer. I'm now dealing with eternity. Well, time passes away. Eternity uh, races forward and it must be prominent to us because time is slipping away. Eternity is real. It's coming. We're accountable for the way we use our time. And only the presence of Christ as Lord of our life can equip us to make God Lord of our clocks and our calendars. You have all the time you need, but don't miss this. Right now, right now really does count forever. Right now really counts forever. Jesus told them a parable in Luke chapter 12 saying, the land of a rich man produced plentifully and he thought to himself, what shall I do for I have nowhere to store my crops? And he said, I'll do this. I'll tear down my barns. I'll build larger ones. And there I will store all my grain and my goods. And I'll say to my soul, soul, you have ample goods laid up for many years. So relax, eat, drink, be merry. But God said, fool, this night your soul is required of you. And the things that you have prepared, whose will they be? And Jesus closes that parable with this statement. So is the one who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. I just want to remind you that that's a parable of, about being faithful and being stewards of life and of time. That man thought, hey, I have, I've done all the work in the kingdom of the world. I'm ready. I can relax. I can be merry because I've done all the things necessary to be that way in the kingdom of the world. And I'm not arguing about making preparations in this life. That's not even the point. But the point was, he made all of those preparations, but he wasn't prepared when God said, the clock has struck midnight, and it's time for your soul to be held accountable. It's going to happen for all of us. So be a wise steward of your clock and your calendar. Would you pray with me? I'm going to ask the band if they'll come this way. Lord Jesus, um, we confess, uh, probably all of us in this place, that we're just not real good at times with the clock or the calendar. And Father, nothing that I've said today is to produce guilt uh, about that. Father, we probably all could feel really guilty about our uh, mismanagement of time at times. But Lord, help us to understand that you've entrusted it to us, and that not only can we be stewards, but you'll help us through the Lordship of Jesus Christ make your will and make eternity priority and, and prominent. So Father, help us where we forget that the eternal trumps everything else. And help us, Father, to allow you to put eternity on our minds so that when we look at the priorities of our life, we look at them in light of what counts forever. Lord, I pray for any that are in this place today, and they've been struggling there, would you help them make a fresh commitment, a fresh commitment to make you first in their calendar and with their clock? And would you help them every day to get up and think and to ask, God, how can I use this day, whatever may come my way, to show you first and to use time 
in a manner that would please you. Lord, I pray for some that are here and uh, Lord, they need to start at the very beginning. They need a relationship with Jesus. Would you help them today to understand how much you love them, doesn't matter what they've done, where they've been, how they've blown it, or if they've even done that, Father, but they just know that they need Christ as their Savior today. Would you, would you convict with your Holy Spirit and show them that today they can change all of that, that they can put their trust in Jesus Christ. Others, Father, looking for a place to connect, not just in small group, but in the larger setting, Father. You've brought them to this place to become a part of this family. Would you help them make that commitment today as well? We love you, and I pray now that you'll bind the enemy, give him no place in this, no part and place in this time of invitation, Father. In Jesus' name, restrict him. But tune our hearts in to hear your voice. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you stand with me for our invitation time? I'll be here at the front. The staff members will be here at the front. You may say, what is an invitation time? It's an opportunity for you to respond to what God may be saying in your heart. Maybe you're here this morning. You say, you know what? I need Christ. I'm not sure if I died, I'd go to heaven. But I want to know Christ as my Savior. Will you slip out, balcony or ground floor? You come this way and say, Pastor, I want to know for sure that I know that I know that I know that Jesus Christ is my Savior, and I want to receive Him, or I want to be assured of that, I want to get assurance of that, and we'll help you with that. You're not going to have to say anything about that. We'll help you, pray with you about that, but you come. You may be here this morning and just want to come and kneel around the altar. I tell you this often, I mean it. It's not a cliche. There is something powerful about a bent knee before God, and that's why we have these in here. Come use it. You may be here this morning and say, you know what, I've been looking for a church home or church family. I think Ridgecrest is the place God wants me, and I want to come and join this place. I'm a believer, and I just need a church family. Would you come? Would you slip out and come and say that? Maybe there's some act of obedience like baptism you need to do. We won't do it today, but we'll set that up, whatever the case may be. As the band leads us, as we sing, you slip out. Our staff is here to receive you. Come on.